So what about the opposite? What if someone says, well, I'm never going to get notes like that. I'm going to have it packed with conflict. And then it's actually too much. It's not subtle. It's not under the surface. Like I'm just thinking of sharp objects. I watched the first episode last mm -hmm. night and you can see seeds planted. Mm -hmm. the, the conflict, some of it's obvious, some of it's not. And you're wondering, hmm, there was a look at the end with this one character. I think there's going to, you know, and it like hints at it. And then it, it keeps you hooked in because you're like, I want to see something go down here. Yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't yet. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's like it's not that you have to hit over, hit people over the head with with constant like, you know, screaming matches or fights or anything like that. To me, it's that there has to be a central problem and a central character faced with that problem that the audience buys into early on and says, OK, I care about this problem. I want to see this problem get solved for this person by this person. Once you have them feeling that way, then you can play out the resolution of that problem over a lengthy period of time. You don't have to get right to it in a really, you know, sledgehammer kind of manner. But the, the, the problem has to be big enough to begin with. It has to be grabby enough to begin with. Then how they evolve in dealing with the problem and how the problem evolves and if it's a mystery, how the cards get turned over and the clues get revealed and the leads get followed up on, that's part of the fun for the audience is that that stuff takes time. You just don't want to have long periods where none of that's happening at all and things seem kind of fine. That's what you want to avoid. Things are never fine in a story. There's always that simmering you know, problem overshadowing everything, I think, in a compelling commercial story where the audience is going, I want to see this resolved. The reason I'm binging on this is I want to see this problem or these problems get resolved. But what, what they really want to see is they want to see how the problems build and complicate and twist and turn and evolve and then later get resolved because you know once it gets resolved it's kind of over so if you're binging on 12 episodes or whatever it is you probably know no real resolution is going to happen until the end of the 12th if then but on the way how it's evolving is the thing that's fun for us to watch as an audience have you given notes to someone to hey tone it down this is too much right here um it's too explosive and it's like almost like beating the 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 reader over the head a little bit I don't think that happens very much unless what they're doing doesn't feel believable to me. Um, that's the sort of the B and problem is, you know, believable. And, and that's a bigger, more common issue than people might think, where readers are reading their stuff and going, I don't believe this character would do or say this. Or maybe it doesn't, it feels contrived in some way. It feels like the writer is trying to force something that isn't organically coming out of the lives and desires and emotions and personalities of the characters. So on, to some extent, the characters do have to drive the story. Everything they, they're doing has to feel like it could and would really happen. They could or would really say or do those things in those moments. So it's not that I'm ever saying, oh, there's too much conflict. You're trying to make the problem too big, per se, unless in doing that, it's straining believability. Because even though stories have usually something exaggerated about them or even sometimes a fantastical element that they're based on, like there's a zombie apocalypse or there's vampires in the high school or whatever, even though they have that kind of stuff sometimes, and even in a comedy you're exaggerating characters a little bit for comedy, I believe there still has to be this basis of reality that we're seeing human beings that we can accept seem real doing or saying what we think they would really do or say in those situations. And a lot of times in a lot of scripts, there will be moments and scenes and characters that don't feel that way, that feel over the top, unbelievable, um, reacting in ways that seem forced for the sake of more conflict or more comedy or entertainment value or more action. So that's where I might sometimes feel that something needs to be toned down so that it feels like it's all coming from a real place. When in doubt, always I say, go for the real. I heard somebody say this once, a professional writer at a, at a panel, and it's so true. You hope that your concept is compelling enough, people are going to care, there's something entertaining at its core, but as you start plotting it out, I always say start with what's real. At every moment in the story, what would each character be really thinking, feeling, doing at this point, given their situation? How do you make them do things that feel totally believable and just totally real? Audiences love it when it feels real, but still is entertaining and compelling and all those other things. And achieving that level of realness that feels really authentic 
is is difficult, but it's really special when a writer is able to just write with like authenticity that is just like, I absolutely suspend disbelief. I, you absolutely have me. I believe these people are real. I forget that I'm watching something fictional. Um, so when you can do that in the context of having these other elements of a story, then I think you're really in good shape. Can you think of a film in particular that, that was like one of the first that did that for you? Well, I mean, I think most really great and successful movies and TV shows do have reality, do have that basis of reality, which is why they work. If they didn't have it, I don't think they'd be successful. So I think you see that in most successful things that there is that sense of, I believe these people and what they're doing. I believe the reality of the situation that the writer has set up. Having said that, there are certain shows, certain movies that I can think of, maybe not the first that did it, but that feel they did it to a really extreme level, like The Wire on HBO, that series, uh, you know, to me kind of made every other cop show that had ever come before seem almost kind of like cheesy or fake in comparison because it felt so real. And when you can achieve that level of realness, audiences, critics, agents, producers, they all respond to that. If you have these other kind of elements of story in place, that level of realness can really make your stuff special. Um, so that's one example. The Sopranos was also a show that even though it, was a, it wasn't trying to be as real as The Wire, when I would watch The Sopranos, I would kind of like just buy it. For some reason, that was a show that I felt like, I don't feel like I'm watching actors and writers and directors, I feel like I'm watching these like real people that are really living in this subculture at its best, which I think is the reason why shows like The Sopranos and The Wire are voted like some of the best written shows of all time, because they obviously did that for a lot of people. Or even Forrest Gump. I mean, I could I could think that that is a real person that if you go on Wikipedia, they'll oh there he is and you know he's <laughs> yes and he, he he beat this person in ping pong and I mean he, it's believable enough as as wild of a ride as his life was that that could be a real person. There's just something about the the writing and and drawing you into this sort of innocent world. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a very opposite example where it's a very fanciful story, sure. but somehow it convinces the audience for those two to three hours that this is a real thing and nothing is making them go, okay, it's not real anymore. I don't get, I mean, there are people that don't like the movie, but I don't think there's much that makes people just check out because it doesn't seem like it could be plausible. You know, the characters, once you establish who they are, they behave in ways that make sense based on who they are and what their psychology and their backstories are and what their current desires and situations are. And that's where it's like the writer, Eric Roth in this case, is going for the real, I think, is taking you know the situation, the people where they're at and saying, what is real to have happen next? And plus, he's throwing in some very damaged supporting characters, you know, Jenny and yeah. Captain Dan and things like that around it. And so as perfect as Forrest might seem, and that he kind of just is always able to, you know, run through, no pun intended, sort of situations, um, he has some very sort of damaged people around them that are very real. And that, that part is also interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at Lieutenant Dan or Jenny in Forrest Gump, they are they are playing out their psychology, their family history, their wounds, their problems, their worst tragedies that have happened to them, and they feel like it's psychologically real. Uh, and that's what I mean when I say real, is like it's like psychologically, based on who they are. I think a writer kind of, a fiction kind of has to be a little bit of a psychologist because you're saying, given this person's history and what they've been through, how would they be now? How would they react in this situation? How would they go about pursuing whatever they want in their lives? And, you know, it's going to vary greatly based on where they come from and what led them to this point. So, um, yeah, it's not it's not easy to do that really well, but when you do, I think audiences respond by totally buying in and being compelled by this psychologically real feeling person that you're putting on screen or on the page. 